Acock 45. What are you looking at? You're looking at some beautiful pieces of uh, hardware and even history. The Colt single action, as you know, if you've been around, one of my favorite firearms is the Colt single action. Well, did a little trading around here at a Civil War show here. Gosh, it's been December, early December, I guess, in 2017. Is it okay that I'm just now getting to it? I apologize. But I did some trading into a second generation Colt single action, and it was made in 1956. Now, that seems like a long time ago. Kind of was. Uh, but we have a couple others here. This one was made in 1887. You can tell by the coin. <laughs> and you've seen that one in a video, I hope. Uh, that's a Colt single action. It's actually a 44. Uh, frontier model and then we have the new the third so the reason I have these others out here we got first generation second generation and then the new one 2017 which is the third generation basically the three generations of Colts and we've talked about those before so just a little uh, I started to say rehearsal a little reminder uh, you know of that because uh, those are the three main segments of the Colt single action. Some people like to call the newest ones the fourth generation. I understand Colt doesn't recognize that designation, so I'll let other people argue about that. I think of them as first, second, and third generation. Okay? So this is the one we are featuring. It's a new one. It is, well, it's not new, 1956, but it's, uh, it's new to me. Yeah, I'm going to put some ammo in it. Should we shoot the Federal? It's cool. I uh, load my five as usual. We have several videos on the Colt single action because I've been a fan of them for a long time. And, uh, you know, just different, different uh, models and different vintage, mainly uh, by year is how you'll find them. Okay. In most cases. So uh, they're just, just gorgeous. Anyway, let's shoot this one. All right. I've shot it some, not a whole lot. It's nice and tight. And uh, I think, well, you know, uh, there's, well, you can tell by the target usually, but you don't know uh, when we're filming this just right away, do you? Uh, not automatically, because it could have been done five years ago. Could have been done five years from now. Uh, I might not even be doing it right now. It just appears I'm doing it right now. And we don't even know when you're watching it. So we don't really know much of anything. So I'll tell you, today is March the 22nd. Okay, and UK, University of Kentucky is playing, I think, in the Sweet 16 here in a couple hours. We're going to watch them play because I'm from Kentucky, believe it or not. And I thought I'd start out just uh, a salute to Kentucky by shooting this blue two liter. How's that? Since I hit it, we'll assume they're going to win tonight. And we'll shoot that Listerine bottle so they'll all have good breath tonight. <laughs> all right. And if they lose, maybe they could go bowling and uh, feel better. How's that? Did he shoot how many? He shot three. Let's shoot this target right away. Put a couple on it. <laughs> Should be empty. Is I aim at pot? Yep, yeah, it's empty. Five shots. All right. If you don't know why I'm loading five, if you're new, go to our video called should you load five or should you load six? I think is the title of that video. It explains all of it much better than I could. Okay, so let's unload it. So what's significant about this one? Uh, 1956 is kind of a significant year and uh, that's why I was attracted to it and wanted to trade into it at the Civil War show. It is the first year that they, uh, they started making them again after World War II. 1956 is when they, they started cranking them out again. They took a little break there for World War II because there were some other firearms that needed to be uh, addressed, <laughs> you know, for World War II. So uh, Colt was uh, making, well, a lot of 1911s, I guess, and other things. But uh, so, and, and actually, I hate to say it, it hurts my heart to say it, you know, I hate to admit it, but from my reading, you know, as it got nearer to, you know, 1940, 
uh, you know, later in the production years of the first generation Colts, the sales, you know, really dropped off. I, I think I read they were making about a hundred a year the last few years of production of the first generation. You know, these first generation guns. That's understandable. You got into the 1930s. You know, look what else was out there. I mean, they started again. If you are brand new to firearms, started making them in uh, 1873. You know, they're extremely popular. Uh, well, you get into the 1900s, the 1910, 20, 1930s. You got a lot of other cool guns, handguns. You got all these Smith and Wessons, right? If nothing else, double action revolvers, the good old Model 10, you know, I think they were called a Model 10 then, but you had a lot of handy revol revolvers. You had the 1911 of all things, you know, so you had a lot of, lot of nice firearms for, uh, for personal protection, or hunting, whatever you wanted to do with them. And the cold single action, slower to load. Didn't have that antique, maybe, uh, panache yet, you know, when people saw probably, I can't speak for them, probably if you were in 1931, of course, depression going on, that made a difference. And you saw one of these, it was kind of worn maybe, or even brand new, you know, you didn't just, probably most people didn't look at the, the shelf of those at the gun store, or usually it was a hardware store, and say, wow, that was the gun that won the West, ooh, a Colt single action, I've been dying for one of those all my life. Yeah, probably some of that, but I think that probably uh, accelerated later on, like in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and, and now <laughs> the same feeling I get when I see one. Uh, because people, you know, back in 1920s, 1930s, they didn't watch as much TV. They didn't see as many of the uh, TV series, the Western series, I don't know why. Uh, most of the TVs were just really not operational at the time. Uh, but of course the movies were kicking off and you know, they were seeing uh, these firearms used in the movies But still production and sales was down and so when World War one two, excuse me came along uh, You know, they they pretty much quit making them I think 1940 was the last year really that they made any of them. I read they made a few during the war a few were pieced together maybe but that was about it so second generation uh, no more Colt single actions being made in the late 40s, really, early 50s. But what happened? All the Western TV shows came out. TV came out, and people were watching Roy Rogers and The Lone Ranger and Wyatt Earp and all those wonderful series that, that are still out there on the, the Western's channel or various places and reruns, TV land, you name it. We've got so many options now. And the Rifleman, just so many of them. And those were, of course, those were new shows in the 50s. And that's what got me hooked, of course. That's one reason I'm a gun nut. And so guess what? The demand came back. And Colt saw that. So did Ruger. And Colt started making it again in 1956, the second generation. And I probably have mentioned that before, but I don't know if I've really, you know, uh, talked about it too much. So... 56, and since this one is one of the first ones back, the first year, I thought I'd uh, kind of relive that little story for you and bore you some more. How's that? So also, we got some rounds uh, when we were in Tombstone. We go to Tombstone almost every year, and these have a tombstone head stamp. Sorry, Federal, we've got to fire a couple of these. They, <laughs> just because they're tombstone brass, it's kind of neat. Uh, Vider might have used some of these. I don't know. There's a little shop there in Tombstone that, that sells these, loads them, sells them. And uh, I usually pick up a box every year. We're there of something, 4440 or 45 Colt. So let's shoot a couple of these. It's got tombstone on the head stamp. Shouldn't be any way to miss. Let's shoot a little pot with them. Smoke a little pot. Yeah. Put a hole in it. Put another hole in it. <laughs> See if it'll smoke a two liter. Only if I hit it, right? See if we can hit a stop sign with it. Click. Not when it's empty. This had to fire a couple of those. Uh, so yeah, in 1956, they started making them again. And uh, these early second generation Colts, for you collectors, you, well, you already know it, uh, or you people who might decide you want one or have to have one of these sometime uh, and are not all that familiar with them. The early second generation Colts are one of the most collectible uh, of them all in terms of the Colt single action. 
they're considered some of the very best made cold single actions. Uh, and they basically just resume using the same tooling. They dug out all the tooling, started making them again, pretty much the same way they had been making them in the 1930s and 40s, you know. And uh, so the, the 50s, the 60s especially, they're considered some of the very best ones. Now, as you get into, I think, the later 60s and, and the 70s, sometimes the quality control is not quite as good. The tools were wearing, the tooling was wearing and everything. I think it was around 74. I read a lot of, uh, or used to a lot, Mike Venturino is kind of an expert on these. And uh, so I'll blame it on him if I'm wrong. But I think it was around 74 that uh, they, they kind of took a break from making them and, and redid all their tooling and everything. So I think there was a couple of years there where they didn't make any or very few. And then they started up uh, again in the 70s, late 70s, mid to late 70s. Those are considered the beginning of the third generation of the, the Colt single action. Okay, so that's kind of it. And on the serial number, when they started the second generation, they started over at one, but they put the SA for single action after the serial number, okay, at the end. And that's one way you can tell. That's kind of a gray area for me. They, I think they still put the SA at the end of the serial number in the later 70s, but I think some of those are not considered second generation. And so you can study all that and make sure if you're planning to, to get one. But the, uh, the early second generation guns are considered some of the very best ones, all right? Uh, made well, made well. And what's so cool is that the, the ones made in recent years, like this one, you know, the Davy Colt you've seen, uh, 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 these are extremely well made. They went back to putting the bushing in the barrel and everything. Uh, the separate bushing in the, excuse me, in the cylinder is removable. It's just like the kind of the first generation guns and second generation guns. So they kind of got back to that and being made really, really well. And of course, as I say this, as we record, you know, we don't know what's going on at Colt and I don't think they're making many of these, if any, right now. I'm not sure they're even taking orders on them, but uh, you know, it's kind of a sad day if they're not. But uh, anyway, uh, there's quite a few of them out there. They're just hard to find now. They're hard, or they're hard to, to find new ones. Uh, if you call Colt and say, hey, make me one, whew, good luck. Who knows when you would get that. So they're, they're becoming more collectible because Colt seems to be having a hard time making them, okay? But, uh, yeah, we still, most of us that are really into firearms just still really, really like them. You know, I mean, I, you know I do. What else was I going to tell you about second-generation guns? Uh, you know, a little bit different grip. Um, this is 7.5. All these are 7.5. That's why I brought out these three. They're the long barrel. One of my favorite links, but then again, as I've said before, I like all the links. They're all kind of cool uh, to shoot. If you're kind of new to shooting, you don't shoot a lot, you'll find this one easier to shoot with a seven and a half inch barrel. Makes it a little bit easier, I think, to hit with it. Now this particular one, as most of them, I guess you could say, it prints a little high to a point of aim. It, it just does. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and reach out there at the gong and I think I have to hold right on the bottom of the gong, almost in the grass, to hit it. We'll see. Yeah, I was holding in the grass. <laughs> I'll do that again. Or try to do that again. Yep, like I said, I'll try. I think I'd hold a little bit lower. Yeah. Okay, so that's the trick, knowing where to hold. Like, I'm going to hit the cowboy here. I'm going to hit him somewhere in the midsection. Right in the heart. But I use Kentucky windage. Again, thank you, Kentucky, because uh, I know where to hold. Now, if I had held, I'd put another one close there. See? If I had held right on the heart, it might have uh, hit him in the top of the head. Let's try left-handed on the stop sign. Click. <laughs> Let's don't say we did. All right. You know I like these things. I'm not going to belabor the point and do a 40-minute video, but uh, gosh, there's just nothing uh, more enjoyable than shooting a single action of any kind. And I, I don't mean to be a snob. Any of the single actions are fun to shoot, whether it's a Ruger, whether it's a Colt clone. They all operate about the same way. They all have one characteristic in common. They're single action. No, the characteristic, well, that too, they take you back to the Wild West. 
They really do. When you pick up that firearm, it just transports you back to Dodge City or Tombstone. It, uh, it really does. Uh, they're, they're just so cool. The simplicity of them in a way, the way they operate. Uh, you need to know what you're doing with them. I've probably mentioned that before too. You know, whenever you cock it, you want to take it all the way back. It's at half cock now. You want to take it all the way back before you let it down. If you're just messing with it or whatever you're doing, you know, protect the action. And then these, uh, these old actions, you know, the, the reason we load five is the firing pin. You can even see it protruding a little bit in there. It can rest against the uh, primer and can fire it. Look at the video I mentioned earlier, and it, it, we demonstrate that pretty well, I think. Now, I know you can put it on a safety cock there, but that, that can be broken off very easily. That little get chipped off if it gets hit on the hammer. You can cock it back there to where the first click, to where it's not against the primer, but yeah, I don't like that either if I'm carrying it for very long. And the old experienced, uh, I say Westerners, you know, anybody might have carried one of these, but you know, back in the day, they did that. They knew to carry five. Let's say they're going to battle, or they're on the range maybe. All right, what else? Let's shoot it again uh, a couple more times. We probably have something else here that needs to be shot. Oh, I know one thing I brought out, forgot to mention. This is an old slug. I paid 15 bucks for it. It's an old 45. I think that one was a Schofield. It's a little shorter. Well, mix those up. Some of my hand loads here. It's a little bit shorter case. I think that was a Schofield. I had forgotten what I bought. I bought that at the same show, actually. And uh, the, the originals were in copper cases like this. Okay. And it is a, actually a center fire, but you don't see that the primer is, uh, I mean, it's in the center. And I guess it would fire if I put it in this firearm. It would be an expensive round to fire, wouldn't it? But uh, that's, this, that's the original you know, rounds, copper and everything. So before they went to brass. So that's a collectible little, little round there. All right, let's finish loading this. I shouldn't have put a round in there and laid it down, I guess. But skip one. Nothing was under the hammer for sure. Good old 45 Colt. Hard to beat. Half cock. Let the hammer down. All right. Oh, you know what? I don't know if I can hit those from up here. Let's try this one, red one here. I'm going to cheat and walk down here a ways. I think I'll put it in the holster just to show off my holster. <laughs> my El Paso rig. See, so if you're carrying this around all day, you're a cowboy. Yeah, really a cowboy. You're riding a horse and saddling up horses and working then you don't you're not really using your firearm very much you know so you don't want to have to worry about it so you put it in there you got the hammer looped down it's not going to fall out of your holster there's not a round under the hammer there's no way it can fire no matter what happens okay and so you got five rounds of 45 or whatever you know caliber you have and you don't have to think about it until you come down here and you see some evil two liters and you want to take them out. Boom. Just like that. And another cowboy needs to be shot in the heart in a bowling pin that I can shoot even though I'm close to it because 45 slugs don't bounce off of bowling pins. <laughs> BBs will. Click, okay. Keep thinking I'm gonna do a left-handed shot and I don't uh, quite get it. Let me empty them out. There's a there's a trick to emptying them without scratching the gun. I'm kind of at least for the for me this works for me. You know, just get a good hand in it and catch those rounds. I'll get that one later. But a lot of people struggle with emptying the cases and they end up scratching the firearm and, and all that kind of thing. So beautiful uh, piece of hardware. This is not the, speaking of that though, this is not the most beautiful one I've ever seen. You look at the difference in the color case, and, and it, I guess it may be from the age. It, uh, the fact is definitely 1956, the first year of production. It was appealing to me, even though it's not one you'd walk by and say, wow, look at that pretty color case hardening, because you know, this is one you might do that with. <laughs> Uh, but you know, it's, it, it almost looks like an Italian clone parts of that color case. Although this part in here is pretty, 
So I'll assume it was all maybe like that at one point. I, I don't know. Or maybe it just wasn't, you know, done as well. Uh, first year of production. I don't know. But uh, usually that wears down anyway, as you can tell. This one was color case hardened at one point. <laughs> the entire frame and the entire hammer, sides and everything. And so it wears off eventually. But uh, so it's not the most beautiful color case hardening. But it's in, the gun is really mechanically sound. It just feels like a million bucks. When you cock it, it feels really solid, all the notches and everything. And uh, the windage is perfect on it, I think. Uh, it shoots a little higher than I like in terms of printing, but it's, uh, it's, it's cool. So 1956 was a very good year because, why? Quiz time, the end of class, because they brought back the Colt single action. And, uh, you know, again, the, the movies, the Western uh, series that were running all the time. Uh, just just brought back the, the popularity, the interest in the firearm, and so Colt was smart to, to bring it back. Now, I don't know what their problem is today. Uh, it seems to me like people like these as much as ever. Uh, they're expensive, but I, I don't know. It seems to me like they could get them, themselves together and, and, and make a few hundred of these at least a year, or a few thousand maybe, whatever the demand is. Uh, so, but I'd rather they not like cheapen them or, you know, or, you know, what happens? They figure out a way to make them less expensive. Yeah, I know what we could do. We could make the frame out of aluminum and uh, let's see, the hammer out of polymer. And we could make these things for $800 and we could sell a bunch of them. Yeah, well, you do that and most of us wouldn't be interested. So I, I want them to keep them the way they are and uh, just make, uh, if they only make five a year, uh, so be it. But please do it, Colt. I feel like there's something I was gonna tell you that was just vitally important and I forgot about it. Uh, and I don't know what it was, but it uh, must not have been too important. They, they uh, well, I know one thing I was gonna mention. I think after they came back in the second generation in 56, they, see, 56, 66. Uh, so you're talking about almost uh, 20 years, the second generation, somewhere in that ballpark that the most common calibers were the, the 45 Colt, the 44 Special. They came out with it, I think, in, after a couple of years, you know, 58 or something, and then 357 Magnum in about 1960, uh, 38, so 38 Special, 357 Magnum, uh, 44 Special, and 45 Colt were the most, I think, popular uh, calibers in the Colt single action during that second generation. And, uh, you know, just, just nice, nice guns made very, very well. You go to a gun show and you'll see a really big gun show, big regional or like a like the one in Tulsa or you know, Louisville, some of the big shows. You'll see a lot of Colt single actions of all generations. And some of these second generation guns, uh, if they're in really good shape, they'll have higher prices than even the first generation sometime. They're just, they're just they've become very, very collectible. Kind of like the old Smith and Wessons, you know, pinned and recessed, the ones that you know were made in whatever 50s, 60s. You know, they've just become another big collectible, you know, item. You know, and it's hard for me to imagine that because I kind of grew up with them, and that's what I was shooting and buying, you know, and at the time, uh, and trading around. But now enough time has passed; they're they're really collectible, and and so are these second generation guns because that period of time is like real estate. You know, the serial number pegs it like a coin. There are only X number of them made, and there's not going to be any more cold single actions made in 1956. Pretty brilliant uh, perception on the other one. So they're kind of like real estate. And uh, I'm going to quit rambling. Uh, I just enjoy these firearms so much, and we may just stay out here for a couple more hours and shoot them all. Uh, I'll put it back in my holster to wrap up here. Yeah, because I might just wear this around for couple of weeks. Good old Colt single action. Still will get the job done. It's a big slug going fast enough. And if you know how to handle one, not bad, not bad. So I don't even need to tell you, life is good. Oh, hi, didn't see you guys there. I was uh, kind of trapped in my own little world there.
So since you guys are here and uh, my amp just fell down anyways and I can't play anymore, I want to let you guys know about our friends over at SDI, the Sonoran Desert Institute. You can check them out at sdi.edu. They are a fully accredited online distance learning program where you can be certified in gunsmithing or get an associate's degree in firearms technology. So check them out, sdi.edu. Also, don't forget our friends over at vaultechsafes.com. Uh, you've seen their safes on the... Uh, on the main uh, shooting table in our main videos. Uh, so check them out if you need a pistol safe. Lock up your pistols. Uh, so don't forget to check them out, vaultexsafe.com. And also you can find us on social media, uh, Hickok45 Facebook. We have a Patreon page now, so you can find us there. There's, there's links to all this probably in the description. Um, Hickok45 on Twitter, the real Hickok45 on Instagram. Uh, there's the Hickok45 and Son YouTube channel. There's uh, my Instagram, which is uh, John underscore Hickok 45 and uh, John Hickok on Facebook, uh, Hickok 45 on Full 30. Uh, and also go to our website, Hickok45.com. You can find all that kind of stuff on there too, as well as usually in the description of the video. So I appreciate you guys. And uh, I don't know if I can uh, make any more noise. Let's see.